The Few by Anti-Fear Specialist D'Amico's Chambers www.begoodtobegreat.com The Few are the people who traveled the journey before you and completed it successfully. The people who once looked at the road ahead and said to themselves, I will make it to the end or I won't make it at all. The people who wanted to give up but gave in to their reason to succeed. The people who believed they weren't built for it, so instead discovered how to construct a way through it. The people who didn't await confirmation, that gave notification. The few exist because most prefer the comfort of present gratification. Most see life one-dimensionally, meaning they only see what's in front of them, in parallel to what occurred in the past. The few... They see what's beneficial to their perspective. There's an element of realism they recognize, but only so that they are in humble communication with the crowd of most in a sincere way. For without the crowd of most, you will become someone stoic in your expertise, but poor in your reward, such as the common lifestyle of a philosopher or a wise man. It's good to have traveled the steps of deeper understanding than most, but useless when you use those steps as a pedestal to raise yourself on rather than a platform to help others rise too. See, the few understand that the richness lies within the crowd of most. If you look at any business or organization within a capitalistic society, you'll notice that those with the fewest skill the least responsibility and the least pay are the ones in abundance within the organization. Take a corporation, for instance. The numbers in people decrease the higher up the chart you rise to the CEO. Because each piece is important, but the few know that the richness comes from the crowd of most. Anyone's disinterest And holding off on comfort for longevity is what makes them an active participant in the crowd of most. This position of theirs individually is inertia until they are moved by desperation or inspiration by people of the few. State story strategy. Michael Jordan, the greatest NBA player of all time and the man whose image should be this era's modern NBA logo. Once said, I never look at the consequences of missing a big shot. When you think about the consequences, you will always think of the negative result. This was his mental state and his approach towards every shot, including the buzzer beaters. His state drove his story that affected his strategy and led to his success. Whether if you're running in your office, riding in your car or wherever you are right now, Check your state. What I mean by your state is your posture. Your posture is the power that will drive your perspective for the rest of the day, further dictating the rest of the week and eventually affecting the rest of your life. Here's the breakdown, and I promise I won't lose you on this one. Your state is going to affect your story, which then is going to affect your strategy. Your posture is is the position of your body, whether you're laying down, sitting, standing, or running. If you're slumped, you divert a different kind of energy. Then if your chest is poked out and shoulders back, this is an automatic sign of how empowered or powerless of a state you're in. Later telling how much control you have of a situation or it has control of you. That's going to spill over into your story. If your state is a strong state, then your story is going to be a strong one. Meaning if you currently pass by someone running or or walking with a strong, steady stride and they were to ask you, how are you doing? Your response would be great, awesome, and even on top of the world. (laughs) That is because it was fueled by your strong state. Now, if you were walking by someone with your shoulders all slumped, or dragging your feet, and then they were to ask you, how are you doing? Your likely response would be, okay, fine, or just getting by. The difference in one story is your whooping ass, 
But in another story, you getting your ass whooped. Now, this all leads up to your strategy. Your strategy is your plan of executing a performance or the solution of a problem. If you're the person who's whooping ass on your run, you get to the end of your destination and someone was to ask you, what is your goal in running? Your response will be not only a goal, but how you're going to achieve it. You're also likely to be confident about it and detailed all the way down to the days and meals that you eat. Why? Because you're in a strong state and that leads you to have an in charge story to you finally taking charge of your strategy. Someone who was in a flimsy state will have a doubtful story and an unsure strategy, no matter the scenario. So again, your state is your physical posture that leads to your story, which is your emotional outlook that ends with your strategy, which is your plan to perform or solve a problem. This is the powder inside the silver bullet of your perspective. Dennis Waitley, motivational speaker and founder of National Council for Self-Esteem, once said, failure should be our teacher, not our undertaker. Failure is delay, not defeat. It is a temporary detour, not a dead end. Failure is only something we can avoid by saying nothing, doing nothing, and being nothing. Your perspective is the way that you perceive a situation based on a various amount of factors. However, this audio is focused on you developing an empowering perspective that will work in the benefit of you. No matter the situation, perceive from it its usefulness to you. How will you take this extremely great or dreadful experience and make it one that you grow from. Because in life as we know it, from plants and animals to nations and human beings, if we don't grow, we die. Your perspective must be one like fire. Consume all that occurs in your life and use it for fuel to grow and get to your goal. Your perspective will dictate the way that you participate. If you perceive life as short, then you will often participate in short-term pleasurable desires. If you perceive the task ahead of you to be difficult but worth it, then your participation towards the goal will be in relentless effort. Our perception and participation works on a tangent. One is reflective of the other. Best form goal. Obstacles are the frightful things you see when you take your eyes off the goal. Henry Ford. My clients who come to me, whether it be personal issues of clout in their life or even complications within their marriage, all have these areas of suffering in their life due to the lacking of one major thing. That thing is a goal. Relationships that don't have a goal within them all fall apart. Just as you do when you get to a point in your life and you feel lost or weak. Your goal is your reason for participation. In order to have direction in your life or a relationship, you must have a goal, right? See, here's the problem. Many people have goals, but they're unrealistic. They're unfulfilling. They're not even enticing enough. And most of all, they aren't detailistic enough to fully envision. The more exact you know of your goal, the more exact of your steps towards it will become. The more vague or blurry your goal is, the weaker its gravitational pull on you will become. Then before you know it, it's just another want instead of a must have. Your goal needs to be realistic and based upon your own standards, not external ones set by society. But what do you know of yourself to be capable of achieving if you just concentrated a little bit more in this area of your life? All humans have six basic human needs, but depending upon the person, we have different needs at higher levels than others. Which of these needs, significance, certainty, variety, connection, growth, or contribution will your goal fulfill? How enticing is your goal? Meaning on a scale from one to 10, how excited does it make you feel when you think about it? If it's not enough to change your state when you think about it, then you need to add more thrill to your goal. 
the enticing portion of your goal plays a major role because if exciting enough, it will change your state and put you back in route of your goal. In order to get to your goal, it must again be realistic, fulfilling, exciting, and detailistic. Envision your goal. Envisioning your goal is when you are able to see your goal without actually having to be directly in front of your goal with your eyes open. Right outside of those key components that make up your goal is reason. What is your reason for attaining your goal? These are reasons that must be sincere and come from the heart. The heart is a place untampered by logic. So therefore, it is the safest place for your reasons to lie. Reasons will keep you going towards your goal when you're tired, when you're alone, when it's dark. It will even make you figure out ways to accomplish a task towards the goal when you're broke. You need reasons and strong ones that are sincere to the heart. See, this reason must come from the heart because your reason is a place that can't be convinced by logic to not exist. See, anything of the mind can be altered by convincing thinking. However, what's in the heart is cemented by emotions and experiences that don't speak the language of logic. For example, most of us love our parents, and yet there were times our parents did or, or said things that made us not like them in the moment. But at the drop of a hat, if they were in any trouble, need or want, we are there unquestionably. That's because our tie to them comes from the heart. Now, let's say you were doing some work for client A and client B comes in with an offer of more money and a task that will do more for your career. All you had to do was put aside work for client A and make client B a priority. Then what would you do? You would set aside client A, right, and start working on client B. That's the convincing method of logic and how someone can talk you out of pursuit of your goal to even have you assist them in pursuit of their goal. Very dangerous. And if your goal is as valuable as it needs to be, that's too risky for its reasons to solely lie within your head. Next, you need to objectify your path towards the goal. What must you complete at each step to accomplish your goal? Your objectives, both large and small, needs to also be specific and in proper order. Keep in mind as a rule for life. The more specific you are about what you want in life, the more specific the universe will direct your path towards it. Being vague in your goal is going to lead to you being vague in your objectives towards accomplishing it. You're going to find yourself doing unnecessary things and spending unnecessary extra amounts of time and resources and objectives that shouldn't have been attempted in the first place due to the vagueness of your goals. Be specific. After you objectify your goal, then schedule your objectives. What date and time do you expect to conquer each objective all the way down to the date and time you expect to attain the goal? Scheduling your objective places expectations of yourself to actually complete the objectives in a timely manner. It creates urgency. Otherwise, you'll just get around to doing them and not even completing them or completing them when you get the chance to. Further prolonging the goal. Completing these four steps of one, developing a goal that's exciting, fulfilling, detailistic and realistic. Number two. Creating heartfelt reasons for accomplishing the goal. Three, objectifying the path towards the goal. And four, scheduling the objectives that lead towards the goal. Completing these four steps will get rid of the clout in your life and relationships because now you'll know where you're going, how, and when you expect to get there. There being your goal, a place of fulfillment reality, and excitement in full detail. Fear. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. Nelson Mandela. Fear serves two purposes in our lives. 
When we decide to face it, we have empowerment. But when we decide to avoid it, we have pain. That pain comes in the form of not achieving the goal, financial turmoil, drama, worry, high levels of stress, being overweight, being weak, and etc. That empowerment comes in the form of achieving the goal, financial success, ultimate loving relationships, health lifestyle, strength, courage, knowledge attainment, and more. Not enough of people know how much a crisis fear is in their lives. But you will when you look at it like this. What is it that you want most right now at this very moment? Don't ponder. You knew the answer as soon as it was asked. Now, what is that one fear in the way of you having that goal? If this audio could literally grab and remove that fear from your life right now and you have that goal, what would it mean to you? Everything, right? That is how vital fear is to our lives. It keeps us from having that everything. Out of every single client I've worked with in derooting their fear, I found that for a majority of us, our fears are rooted from our adolescence. Something traumatic occurred when we were between the ages of 5 to 19 and even into our adult years that caused us to submit that perspective and carry with us for the rest of our lives. The problem is that perspective we've carried since an adolescent is one we still use in our adult lives. Picture your view on public speaking as a grown woman at 30 years old. Still perceiving to have the same experience you once had when you were 12 years old. This means every time you're offered to speak in front of a crowd, you see it with the same outcome you once did when the traumatic experience first occurred at 12 years old. So you pass on the offer to speak, avoiding the fear, passing up the chance to get your message out, pain, passing up your chance to receive fulfillment, pain, passing up a potential increase in income and notoriety, pain. In order to deroute the fear, you must first adjust the perspective of the adolescent youth inside you. To get to him or her, you must close your eyes and submerge yourself in the time period where the fear first occurred for you. Once you're there, you must examine the actions that took place carefully and dissect them using your adult matured mind and experiences. Once you've gathered out a way you could have better dealt with the situation, you must share the solution with your younger self in a way that it will perceive and fully understand it. Once you've gathered out a way you could have better dealt with the situation, you must share the solution with your younger self in a way that it will perceive and fully understand it. We can't change the past, but we can change how we once perceived it. We originally had a perspective that was weak, but now due to your new analyzation as an adult, passing that information on to your younger self allows them to develop a stronger perspective of that experience. Once this is completed, you must tell your younger self all the things from the heart that it needs to hear to be reassured that it can now trust you again with their life. Once you have its trust, you are now whole again from an experience of you that you once left behind to fend for itself. Now at peace with the past experience and turning a young, immature, timid perspective into a strong, empowered one. That is how you deroot your fear. Now, the only way to test it out is to try it out by performing the task you once feared that was in the way of a goal. Now, you may want to wait a couple days to give this new perspective time to submit emotionally and chemically as you will be experiencing some weird feelings and thoughts internally. That's a result of your fear being uprooted from your system and empowered perspective being planted inside its place. When it's time to face that fear again, you'll surprise yourself of the reaction you'll have and how unrestrained you'll feel at performing. Become the few. I've never viewed myself as particularly talented. I view myself lightly above average in talent. Where I excel is with ridiculous, sickening work ethic. While the other guy's sleeping, I'm working. While the other guy's eating, I'm working. While the other guy's making love, I mean, I'm making love too. 
but I'm working really hard at it. Will Smith. By attaining your goal and defeating your fear, you've reached to your best form. The best form is a condition of yourself that is able to highly perform at any given task. Because now you are equipped with the skill it takes and stripped yourself of unnecessary fat and doubt that once held you back. You now have the opportunity of becoming a part of the few. There's no such thing as a complete loss, but pure lesson. Strength to gain from pain, patience in the midst of a storm, truth in the sight of lust, focus during the starvation, and abundance in a few seeds. The few aren't a group of people who reached a point in their lives. The few are a group of people who've made it a point to keep reaching until the end of their lives. Be good or be great.